Okay, this is 8.4, Motion of Charged Particles in Magnetic Fields. This is where we're going to end Chapter 8 and where we're going to end the unit. We're talking here about how charged particles move when they're in a magnetic field. We have a few situations, and the first one we're looking at is, let's say that the, the particle is moving parallel to the magnetic field, parallel to B. So the picture to the right here, we have our charge, it's moving horizontally, and our field is horizontal, they're all in the same direction. That means that theta is equal to zero degrees, and Fm is equal to Q V B sine theta. Well, if theta is zero, sine theta is zero, so that just means that this whole thing equals zero. There's no force. And so that's always true. Uh, if um, if our particle, sorry, if our particle is moving parallel to our magnetic field, then it doesn't experience any magnetic force whatsoever. Now our second situation here is if the particle is moving perpendicular to that field. So let's say the field is still horizontal, like in this picture, and now our particle, let's say it's starting and it's moving in this, uh, in this vertical direction. Okay. So if it's moving perpendicular to, to B, then we have theta is equal to 90 degrees, which means Fm is equal to QVB. I could write sine theta, but sine of 90 degrees, that's just equal to 1. So Fm is equal to QVB. Now remember that when we have a magnetic force, that force is always, always, always perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the movement. So we can say here, the force is always perpendicular to movement. Okay, so let's see what we've got here. We've got a constant force. Our force here, if we're moving perpendicular, is QVB. That's what we're dealing with. And if our force is perpendicular to the movement, that might sound familiar to you. If we've got a constant force that's acting perpendicular to our movement, that gives us circular motion. So our result here is circular motion. with a fixed radius. And so that's what happens. If we have a particle moving in our magnetic field, perpendicular to the field, it's going to end up going around in a circle over and over and over again. And we can actually calculate that. Uh, now, how we would do that, we say that we, we now have centripetal motion. We're going around in a circle. So that means we have some centripetal force and this centripetal force is being provided by our magnetic force, Fc equals Fm. So I can write that Fc is mv squared over r, and that's equal to QVB. And we can rearrange that. If we want to find the radius of this circle, we can rearrange that and we get this equation down here. r is equal to mv over Q B. Okay, that is our equation now for finding the radius when a when a particle is moving in a circular motion. And so we're going to work with that a few times. We're going to see how that uh, how that works. Our first problem says an electron starts from rest. We have the mass there of the electron. A horizontally directed electric field accelerates the electron through a potential difference of 37 volts. The electron then leaves the electric field and moves into a magnetic field with strength 0 0.26 teslas directed into the page, so away from you. Determine the speed of the electron at the moment it enters the magnetic field. So this first part, it's not even using any of our magnetic knowledge. This is going back to what we've learned about electric fields and how, um, how this thing is going to be accelerated. So we have our, our potential difference of 37 volts. and Remember, we're going to be using some conservation of energy here. So we're increasing our kinetic energy. So I can say delta EK, the increase in kinetic energy. Well, that's going to equal the loss in electric energy. 
negative delta EE. E. Negative delta EE. E. And now I can write my, um, my statements here. So EK is 1 half MV squared. And I can just say V, it starts from rest, so my V is my final velocity. So 1 half MV squared is equal to, and we've got our change in kinetic energy, delta EK. So you might remember that that is equal to, or sorry, delta EE. E. You might remember that this is equal to Q delta V. Good. So 1 half mv squared equals q delta v, and we want to find v. So v is going to equal the square root of q delta v, um, well, times 2 divided by m. I'll take the square root of that guy. Okay, so we'll pop over here, plug in some numbers. So we've got the square root of 2 times 1.60, our q is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. And our delta v, the change in our, uh, our voltage there is 37 volts. And we divide that all by our mass of the electron, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. Take the square root of that whole guy, and this gives us a V of 3.605 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. There we go. So that's our speed when we enter the magnetic field. That didn't use any magnetic knowledge there, that was using our electric knowledge. Okay, now we want to determine the magnitude and direction of the magnetic force on the electron. Okay, so magnitude and direction of the magnetic force. Here we go. We have Fm is equal to QVB sine theta. And we said that we're moving to the right, and our electric field is going away from us. So that means they're perpendicular. The angle here is 90 degrees. So I can plug in my values here. We've got 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. Our V is what we got above, 3.605 times 10 to the 6. B, our magnetic field was 0 0.26 Teslas. And our angle, sine 90 degrees. OK, so this is going to get us the magnitude and so I'm just going to put this to the right so we have room still for the direction. Magnitude here is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 13 newtons. That's our magnetic force. And we want our direction, so I'm going to go look at the picture again. Remember, for the direction, we want to um, point our thumb in the direction of the movement, and then my fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. So my thumb is pointing right, my fingers are pointing into the page, towards the page, and then my palm goes in the direction of, um, of movement. So I'm, I'm, my palm goes upwards. But the last piece here is that it's a negative charge, not positive. So it means that actually the movement is going to be opposite that. It's going to be downwards. Okay, so our direction, so direction, is going to be downwards. That's because charge is negative. All right, now, um, since we've got this perpendicular force here, it means that we're going to be going in a circle in the end, so we want to determine the radius of this circular path. We can use our equation that we had above, this R equals mv over QB, and I can plug in my numbers here. So we've got the mass, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31. My speed was 3.605 times 10 to the 6, and divide that by Q 
1.60 times 10 to the negative 19, and B 0.26 Teslas. This gives me a radius of 7.9 times 10 to the negative 5 meters. And there we go. That's the full solution to that sort of a problem. It covered a lot, so I think that was good. Okay, so now the next page we're going to be looking at um, a topic called mass spectrometers. And we're doing the same thing, but with these mass spectrometers. So let me just describe here what a mass spectrometer is. So picture you have a beam of ions. And it goes through a magnetic field. A beam of ions goes through a magnetic field. The lighter and more positive ions are deflected more and when I say deflected it means that they they experience more force their movement ends up changing more so they're deflected more which letting us measure their mass and charge so if we send these ions through this chamber this beam and we deflect them using a magnetic field if we measure how much they're deflected how much they're affected by the magnetic field we can find out how much their mass and their charge must be and that's what a mass spectrometer that is what is used in a, a lot of scientific disciplines to, to do some, some um, very advanced research. So we're going to talk about how we can do this now. Um, the first problem says, a researcher using a mass spectrometer observes a particle traveling at 1.6 times 10 to the 6 meters per second in a circular path of radius 8.2 centimeters. The spectrometer's magnetic field is perpendicular to the particle's path and has a magnitude of 0 0.41 teslas. First, we want to calculate the mass to charge ratio of the particle. So I want to get the mass divided by the charge. Okay, so um, we can go back to, well, we can go back to our equation here, which was R equals mv over qb. And I want to get mass over charge, m over q. So you can see here, if I want to get m over q by itself, we get m over q is equal to, well, I just need to move some things around. I got rb over v. Look good. Okay, so rb over v, now we just need to plug in some values here. Our radius was 8.2 centimeters, so 0 0.082 meters. b, 0 0.41 teslas and divide by our speed 1.6 times 10 to the 6 and this gives us a ratio of 2.1 times 10 to the negative 8 kilograms per coulomb okay and so why did we do that well I told you that the um, deflection here is going to depend on two things the mass and the charge of this particle we don't know which is which. We don't know whether it has a lot of mass that's uh, causing it, or not much mass that's causing it to be deflected, or lots of charge. So we just get the ratio of the two. We say, what's th what has to be the ratio of mass over charge? And you can see we get a unique number, 2.1 times 10 to the negative 8. So this particle has to have that ratio. And then we've got down here a table of different ratios for different substances we know that hydrogen has this ratio of mass over charge deuterium has this ratio so we can actually use this table to figure out what's happening 
So I look, I have 2.1 times 10 to the negative 8. That looks a lot like deuterium here. You can see we have 2.09, 2.1. So therefore, the particle is deuterium. Good. And so that's how we can identify that particle. And that is how mass spectrometers are used. Okay, we have one more problem here. It says a researcher uses a mass spectrometer in a carbon dating experiment. The incoming ions are a mixture of carbon-12 and carbon-14. They're both positive ions here. And they have a speed of 1.0 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. The strength of the magnetic field is 0.1 teslas. And the mass of an electron is that, and the mass of protons and neutrons is that. Good. So we want to say, the researcher first positions the ion detector to determine the value of R for the carbon-12. And then it moves to, um, and then the researcher moves it to determine the value of R for carbon-14. So how far must the detector move between detecting the two isotopes? All right, so what we're having here, we're sending these charges these carbon 12s and carbon 14s, we're sending them down here with this initial speed. They enter the magnetic field and then immediately start having this curved path. And depending on whether it's carbon 12 or carbon 14, the path will be more curved or less curved. Okay, and so carbon 12 might be set up here. We have to put our ion detector here. And carbon 14 might have a larger radius, so it means that we would have to put the detector down here. And the question is, what's that distance? What's the difference, uh, distance between those two points? So we're going to have to do a few things here. We're going to need to find some mass. We're going to have to find some radius. And, um, and then we should be able to use our equation. So first up, we need to get the mass of these two things. So our mass of carbon-12, this is equal to, we've got six protons, so six times the mass of a proton, plus we've got six neutrons, so six times the mass of a neutron. And then we said we've, we're an ion with one positive charge, so it means we have one less electron than protons. So we've got five times the mass of an electron. Okay, and that's going to give us, well, I'm not going to write out all the numbers there. Um, we've got the mass of each of those above. Gives us a total of 2.004 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. Good, so that's the mass of our carbon-12. And we need to do the same thing for the carbon-14. So now we have carbon-14. We still have just six protons. We've got two extra neutrons now and we still have a positive charge here, so we still only have five electrons. And if you add those all up, you'll get 2.338 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. All right, so now that we have the mass of each of those, we can get the radius for each of these guys. So the radius for carbon-12 is going to be the mass of carbon-12, mv over qb. So let's see, we've got our 2.004 times 10 to the negative 26 times our speed. Our initial speed was 1.0 times 10 to the, neg uh, 10 to the 5 meters per second over QB, 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19. Remember, we've got one positive charge on this guy. So that's the charge, and our field is 0 0.10 teslas. Good. So this gives us a radius of 0 0.1252 meters. Excellent. And now we need the radius for our carbon-14. The mass of carbon-14 times V over QB. So we get the same thing. I'm not going to um, write out all those numbers. 
again, you can see that the only thing that's going to change is the mass of the carbon-14, and we end up getting 0 0.1461 meters. So we have our two values for the radius. Now we need to figure out the distance that the ion detector needs to move. Now that's going to be a distance in diameter. Um, and so the diameter, that's just twice the radius. So we can say now our delta D is going to equal twice the difference in the radiuses. So we've got the radius of carbon-14 minus the radius of carbon-12. We multiply that by 2. That's going to give us the distance that it needs to travel. So we have 2 times 0 0.1461 minus 0 0.1252. And it gives us a value of 0 0.04 meters. And there we go. So we need to move it 4 centimeters for that to work. That's how these problems work. They can, I think, stack up a bit. Um, but I think you can handle it. And this is the end of the unit. So good luck and have fun with that.